continuing the theme that we started the year with, we still. How do we have a better appreciation of what it means to be in God's presence, to have him? I'm going to be reading a few verses from 1 Kings 19, from verses 9 to 13. I should give this a bit of context, though. This is a story about Elijah the prophet. It comes right after that infamous showdown. I'll be elaborating on that more, but that he has with the priests of Baal on Mount Carmel, which God is actually going to send fire. But then you get the aftermath where, even though it looks finally like things are going in the right direction again in Israel, they don't. And Elijah runs away, he runs to the wilderness. He finally ends up at Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. And that's where we pick up the story. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. The Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. And the voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, help us again to know your ways. Teach us your paths. Lead us in your truth and teach us, for you are the God of our salvation. For you we wait all day long through Christ our Lord. Amen. People of God, as I was thinking about what I was going to say for this service, I started thinking about how you know, so many people, so many people will say things like, you know, what, what I wouldn't give, what I wouldn't give for some peace and quiet. I would love that, just to, to have some me time, some time to get away, just clear my head, clear my thoughts, get centered. A lot of people will say stuff like that, but I've realized too, you know what? Reality is most people, most of us, we tend to get uncomfortable, really uncomfortable, when things actually do get quiet. Sometimes if you're a parent, it's because, you know, it's your kids. If you don't hear what's going on, what are, what are they up to? But the thing is, too, most people, they don't actually know what to do with themselves when it gets quiet, especially when it's too quiet. And on those rare occasions when you get real silence, genuine silence, it's interesting, a lot of people, they'll just about lose it. They'll just start... Okay, okay, that's enough of that. I, I, I gotta do something. Where's my phone? Where's my phone? Where are my friends? Because I, I can't do this. I, I, gotta, I gotta have something going on. I gotta have some noise. I'm not saying that's good or bad. That's just, to me, how most people are. Most of us, as much as we think it would be nice to have some quiet time, to have some downtime, just to be alone, get away from it all, put it far away from us, Few people actually want that, at least not for extended periods of time. Most of us, we don't like it when we realize suddenly, you know, I am totally alone. We don't know what to do with ourselves when there's nobody else around. 
Most of us, for that reason, we prefer to be busy. We actually like having other people around, at least a few. Most of us need at least some noise in our lives, even if it's just in the background. And when you, look, when you look at what happened with Elijah, you realize he's not that different. He was wired pretty much the same as the rest of us. Elijah was a prophet. He was someone who, who stood up and spoke in the name of the Lord. He did so at a time when being a prophet, especially a prophet of the Lord, could be a really lonely, isolating job. During his time, the people of Israel, the people that God had rescued from slavery in Egypt and had brought to the Promised Land, they had pretty much forgotten about God. Under the leadership of wicked kings like Ahab and his queen Jezebel, the people of Israel had gone astray. They had abandoned the one true God and they'd gone after other gods, false gods like Baal, Ashtoreth. And so there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of demand for someone like Elijah, for someone who would stand up and say, thus says the Lord. Elijah was pretty much on his own a lot of the time. And yet when you look at what happened to him, especially if you read through 1 Kings chapter 19, you realize, like I said, Elijah wasn't that different from most of us. Like most of us, Elijah needed at least some noise in his life. He'd gotten used to having a certain level of noise going on in the background. In his work as a prophet, he had spent years struggling against the tide. He was that lone voice that dared to speak out against the, the immorality and idolatry perpetrated by Ahab and Jezebel. But, but over time, over time, Elijah seems to have gotten used to that. He'd gotten used to the protests, the insults, the threats. Elijah had gotten used to all that noise. But then, we're told in 1 Kings 18, after years of being out in the wilderness, both figuratively and literally, Elijah, Elijah finally got to hear a different kind of noise. If you look through 1 Kings 18, that's where you get that story I mentioned earlier, that great showdown. On the one hand, you have Elijah, the prophet of the one true God, versus the prophets of Baal. Elijah confronts these prophets of Baal, all 400 of them or so, and sets up a simple test. Here's what we're going to do. You, you prophets of Baal, you go and build an altar for your God. You get your sacrifice ready for him. Do all that, no fire. Don't set it on fire. I'm going to do the same for my God. And whichever of these gods, the Lord, the God of Israel, or Baal, your God, whichever of them sends fire down from heaven, he is the true God. So then, when the Lord, the God of Israel, when he turns out to be the only one able to send fire down from heaven, Baal can't even muster a puff of smoke. But when that happens, suddenly the air is filled with a noise, noise of a people who have finally come back to their senses. The people of Israel finally seem willing to acknowledge the truth that they've been, been avoiding all those years. They finally are confessing, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. It seems somehow in the midst of all that noise, somehow, somewhere along the line, Elijah seems to have stopped hearing the voice that matters most, the voice of God. We're told at the very start of 1 Kings 19, Jezebel, the evil queen, she finds out not only did Baal betray her, good use of the word, not only did Baal let her down and not send fire, but thanks to Elijah, all her prophets are no more. They're deceased. And so she sends Elijah this little message. May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I don't make your life like one of theirs. In other words, Elijah. And somehow then, between the shouts that people have Mount Carmel had been making the one day, and those threats from Queen Jezebel the next. Somewhere in that mix, Elijah somehow is no longer able to hear God's voice. He can't hear God for all the noise. 
Because what does Elijah do once he gets this threat from Jezebel? What does he do? He gets scared. He, he panics. He starts to run. And where, where does Elijah run to? He heads out to the wilderness. Why there? Because basically back then, that's what you did. That's where people went to meet with God. You, you look at Israel's greatest leaders from before Elijah's time, people like Moses, David, that is where they went and experienced something of God's power, something of his, of his presence. They went to the wilderness. And so Elijah, he also heads out to the wilderness. But it seems once he gets out there, he can't handle it. He can't handle the quiet. He's out there hoping to get away from all that noise, hoping that he will now hear the voice of God once again. But instead, he's out there. And he's overwhelmed by another kind of noise. It's the noise coming from within his own head. You look at verse 4 of chapter 19, 1 Kings 19, verse 4. He himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed he might die. Elijah just collapses. He collapses, he gives up. All he's hearing is the noise in his own head. That's it. I've had it. Lord, I have had enough of this. Who am I kidding? I've been wasting everyone else's time. Just, just end me, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. They couldn't do it. Neither can I. Basically, what happened to Elijah, he started having a hard time dealing with all the noise. He'd spent all this time being that lone voice, the one, the only one still calling God's people to come back to him again. And then for a brief moment, it looked like all his effort, all his hard work had paid off. Everyone was finally on his side. Everyone was calling out, calling out the Lord. He is God. The Lord, he is God. But then, just like that, one word from Jezebel, they're all gone. And Elijah's left standing there going, hey, where, where'd you all go? And in a way, all that noise that's now coming from inside Elijah's own head, that's, that's the aftermath of everything he's just been through. You think about it, how do you start to make sense of an experience like that, that you go from being up there literally and figuratively on the mountaintop, you're having this awesome spiritual high, and then it just comes crashing down as hard as it did for Elijah. The thing is, what seems to have scared Elijah even more, it wasn't just the noise, I think it was the silence, the apparent silence of God. Because just, just when the people of Israel finally seem to be getting it again, Baal's not God, God is God. Just when they finally seem to be on board with Elijah, they're ready for whatever's next, there seems to be nothing, nothing from God. And when Jezebel's message comes, it's clear she's not going to back down again. Seems to be nothing from God, no word. It's so out in the wilderness, under that broom tree, Elijah has all this stuff, all this noise going on in his head. He's angry at God. He's disappointed. Why hasn't God done something? And again, he doesn't seem to hear anything from God. Just silence. Where is God? Everything's falling apart. Isn't he going to do something about it? Doesn't God get angry anymore and act? That got me thinking, too, what, what Elijah goes through out in the wilderness. It's almost something like he experienced in family life. Like it or not, there's times when fathers get angry. And usually... You know when dad's angry, when he's mad. There is yelling, there is screaming, there's often arms are flailing around. What are you guys doing? Then there's other times. Not as often, hopefully. 
But other times, you know, you know that dad is really, really angry because he's not saying anything. There's just silence. It's those times you're scared because you know, you know, you really crossed the line. To be honest, I think, I think we sometimes run to that same kind of thing in our relationship with God. As much as we like the idea of silence, be still and know, know that I'm, I'm God. As much as we like this idea that there's times it's okay to say no to certain things to make time to get to know God really well. We still have a really hard time with his silence. We have a hard time when it seems God is silent. We're so used to noise. So often we come to God with certain expectations of him. He's going to come. When he comes, it's going to be flashy. It's going to be big. It's going to be spectacular. God's going to come and everybody's going to fall on their knees, whether it's out of adoration or desperation. So we know when God comes, he's going to be angry at some people. And we're kind of okay with that when it's anger at someone else. So often when, when all is still, when we end up all by ourselves and everything gets quiet, there seems to be nothing, nothing, just silence. That, that can make us nervous. We start to panic. Where, where is God? What is he doing? Why is he staying silent? And there's times then we'd almost prefer if he was angry, just yell at us or something. At least then we'd know he was there. But when there seems to be nothing, nothing but silence, we don't really always know what to do with it. That, that scares us. The thing is getting back to Elijah. When Elijah is finally ready to listen, the Lord is already there. The Lord's been there with him all along. And the word of the Lord comes to Elijah. What, what are you doing here, Elijah? In the original Hebrew, the actual question is, is more like, what is here for you, Elijah? What is here for you out in the wilderness? What are you expecting to find here? And Elijah starts, starts pouring out everything on his, on his heart. I have been so very zealous for you, Lord, Lord God Almighty. I've done everything I can. But the Israelites, they've rejected your covenant. They have rejected you. They've torn down your altars. They don't want to talk to you. And they have killed your prophets. They don't want you talking to them. And I, I'm the only one left. The only one on your side, and now, now they're trying to kill me too. Elijah pours out his heart before the Lord. But behind what he says, there's still something he's not saying. Between the lines, you can hear Elijah asking, demanding, God, God, why haven't you done something then? Do something. Get those people's attention. Make some noise. Why have you been quiet? And what God does, he gives first Elijah these three signs. First, there's this, this great and powerful wind strong enough to tear the mountains apart, to shatter the rocks. And after that, there's an earthquake. After that, fire. And each time one of those signs passes by, you can just about imagine Elijah standing there holding his breath, waiting for God to come. God isn't in any of them. God isn't in the wind. God isn't in the earthquake. God isn't in the fire. Now that is not to say that God never comes in wind or fire or earthquake. You can't say that God never, ever comes in big, dramatic, noisy ways because you read the rest of the Bible and you find out God has come with power. He's come with glory. He's come with noise before. He's done it lots of times, and if he wants to, I'm sure he'll do it again. 
but he doesn't always. Because this time, with Elijah alone out there in the wilderness, God comes, he comes in a gentle whisper. God comes in the quiet. God is there in the silence. God is there, even though Elijah thinks nothing is happening. God is there even when Elijah can't hear him for all the noise. Now we need, we need to be careful what we do with this, with this story. Because I've noticed it's tempting sometimes to try and oversimplify things. It can be really tempting to assume, well, the point of this story is, is God never comes in big flashy ways. It can be really tempting to assume that when you seek God, you have to be quiet, calm. The way people talk about it, you almost think it borders on comatose. But again, when you read the Bible, you realize God does both. Sometimes when he comes, he does make it really obvious. There are times when people have no problem hearing his voice. But there are other times when it feels like he's not there. And he's fallen silent. The fact is he's there. He's still there. God is simply under no obligation to come to us the way we expect him to. He's God. He doesn't have to do tricks to impress us. And that, that should prepare us for what happens later on. But you keep reading this story. You get to the part where God sends his own son. And then he undertakes what is the ultimate showdown against the powers of evil and sin and unbelief. Because Jesus finally does come. That too, it's not the way anyone would have expected. People then were looking for a great and powerful king, someone who would deliver them from their enemies, someone who would come with sound and fury. But instead, what they get is someone who, as the prophet Isaiah once said, will not quarrel or cry out. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Instead of a king coming on a white steed, they get a king who comes gentle, gentle and riding on a donkey. Instead of sound and fury, we get someone who did not open his mouth as a sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Instead of stretching out his hand against those who rejected him, Jesus lets his hands be stretched out on the cross so that he can take those nails for you, for me. So what do, we, what do we do with all that then? What are we supposed to take away from all this? One thing I think it's worth considering, worth thinking about, what is it, what is it that we are really after? When we come to God, what is it we're really looking for? What are we really seeking? Is it quiet, peace, silence? Is that all we're really after? Or is it activity, action, noise? Or are we looking for more? Are we really seeking after God himself? Because that, that is what God is really after. What he wants is for us to have him. What God wants is for us to be in relationship with him again, to have us as his people, and for us to have him as our God. And that's why he sent us his own son, to take away the sin and shame that had come between us and him, and to make it possible for us to live as his people once more. So don't be too, don't be too surprised then. If you're, if you're maybe the type who craves quiet and calm, God may then very well send you storms and earthquakes and fire. If you're the type that's wired to be busy, you need action, you need noise, God may then choose to come to you instead in the quiet, in the silence, when you think absolutely nothing's going on. 
And the reason he chooses to do that at times is because what God wants for us is more. It's bigger than us just getting to enjoy one particular kind of experience or another. What God wants us to have is more than just those things we so often associate with him and with his presence, the, the extras. But what God wants is for us to get to the place, to the point where we understand, where we know no matter what, whether absolutely everything seems to be going on at once or absolutely nothing at all seems to be happening. God wants us to know that he has us. And we, we get to have him. Let's pray. Loving God, our Father in heaven, it can be so hard for us at times to hear you, to hear your voice through all the noise around us. We get bombarded with voices trying to draw us away that want to distract us from you. But then we get up, we get caught up too, Lord, with our own noise, our own expectations. We get it in our heads that you should be doing things a certain way and in a certain time. But then when we miss your voice, when we can't hear you, we wonder where you are. While you're silent, Lord, help us to get beyond both the noise and the quiet. Help us to get beyond our own ideas about who you are and what you should be doing. Help us to seek you above and before anything else. Help us to seek after you, the God who has come to us in Christ. And all God's people said, Amen.